Cultural landscapes are kind of a big deal in Unit 3, so I reckon we ought to talk about them. So if you're ready to get them brain cows milked sequent occupant style, well, let's get to it. Okay, let's begin with a definition. First of all, a physical landscape refers to every feature of the natural environment that is visible to the eye. Look, there's a tree. Oh, and there's a mountain. Oh, and look, there's a creek. So physical landscapey. But a cultural landscape describes how a natural landscape has been modified by humans in a way that reflects their culture. There's a house. Oh, and there's a farm. Oh, and there's a quick trip. Now, all of these modifications of the natural landscape reflect a society's culture. Oh, and by the way, if you want note guides to follow along with this video and all my videos, check that sweet link in the description. So now that you understand what a cultural landscape is, let's consider six factors that help us evaluate a cultural landscape. First are agricultural practices. And since agriculture is the most basic and fundamental use of land among humans, the way that different societies practice it tells us about the world that they inhabit and invokes a sense of place distinct to that location. For example, look at these terraced rice paddies. You may not know exactly where these are located, but if you're an American, you probably have a hunch that they are not in America. And that hunch would be right. This is a distinctive agricultural practice found in Asia and Southeast Asia. But look at these cornfields. Again, if you're an American, you probably have a hunch that this is the landscape somewhere in the Midwest. And if so, your hunch factory is on point because that's exactly where this okay, is. Okay, now a second factor for evaluating cultural landscapes is industrial practices. And here you need to understand that the way people engage in economic activity also leaves a mark on their physical environment. In some cases, that industrial mark is kind of bland and generic, and that can lead to a sense of placelessness. For example, here's the QT. And then right across the street is a Starbucks. Now, if you had to tell me where in America I am, you probably could not because there are QTs and Starbucks across the intersections from each other all over the place. And that's the idea of placelessness. The industrial practices that led to this arrangement are not unique to this area. On the other hand, industrial practices can be more indicative of regional or local culture. Like look at these row houses that are all over Baltimore, Maryland. As an industrial center in the 19th century, these row houses were constructed for the many rural people flooding into the city to look for work in the industrial sector. And some of these have been standing for more than a century and new houses are still built in this style. Like it's a part of their culture and economic history, which tells us something about who they are. A third factor that helps us evaluate cultural landscapes include religious characteristics. What I mean is, people in most religions construct buildings which reflect their faith and create sacred spaces in the landscape. For example, this is the majestic Hindu slash Buddhist temple called Angkor Wat located in Cambodia. And human geographers go crazy about this kind of building and how it interacts with its space and what that says about the people who built it. I mean, the magnificence of the architecture aside, notice how this temple is fully separated from the surrounding area by this human built moat. Not only does it help regulate the groundwater on the island, but it's also a symbolic barrier that communicates that this land is special and set apart. Fourth, linguistic characteristics are part of the cultural landscape. For example, consider the signage in various places. The language on the signs gives you a sense of the people who are there. For example, in New York City's various Chinatowns, restaurants and stores have signs written in both English and in Chinese. Or in Miami, many signs are written in English and Spanish. Fifth, evidence of sequent occupants helps us understand cultural landscapes as well. The idea here is that every past generation leaves its mark on the cultural landscape, and the evidence of those marks is known as sequent occupants. It means that we can look at a cultural landscape and not only draw conclusions about the current people who live there, but also about the many people and cultures who have lived there in the past. For example, this is the Hagia Sophia in Istanbul, Turkey. It was a church built in the 6th century by Eastern Orthodox Christians, and this architectural style was pretty common in the Byzantine Empire. But then the Muslim Ottoman Empire went ahead and took over in 1453 and converted it into a mosque, and they added these towers called minarets to the complex. Then in 1935, the Hagia Sophia was turned into a museum by the secular government of Turkey, and then in 2020, it was converted back into a mosque. So the point is, you can see the evidence of different cultures leaving their imprint on this building over time. And sixth, the presence of traditional or postmodern architecture helps us understand a cultural landscape. Traditional architecture describes a method of building that uses local materials found close to the building site and that reflect the needs of the people. Remember in the previous video I mentioned the abundance of adobe style homes in the American Southwest. This style of dwelling was developed by the Pueblo people who lived there from time immemorial. By building their houses out of local mud, they were able to stay warm in the winter and cool in the summer. And when the Spanish colonizers came in, they were like, yeah, let's do that. And so they adopted Pueblo techniques for their own purposes. And to this day, even though we've developed all kinds of technology that makes adobe building unnecessary, you know, like air conditioning and central heating, people still build their homes in this traditional manner, and that tells us a lot about their culture. On the other hand, the presence of postmodern architecture also helps us interpret cultural landscapes. Now, this was a style of architecture that arose in the 1960s as a reaction against modernist architecture, which was characterized by straight lines and very little ornamentation. We're talking function over form here. In other words, the modernist building itself tells us that what goes on inside those buildings is much more important than how the building looks. But then postmodern architects decided that that was dumb and they wanted their buildings to be more than the structural equivalent of plain white toast. In other words, postmodern architecture was intended to make buildings more culturally expressive by emphasizing both form and function. For example, the Guggenheim Museum in Balboa, Spain. This building houses art, but is also a work of art itself. I mean, all that's necessary to show art is a box made out of bricks, but the architect of this building, Frank Lloyd Wright, wanted to express the spirit of the place. Okay, now what we just did is try to understand how cultural landscapes 
values can tell us about the people who live in a place. But now, looking at it from the other side, let's consider how society's values determine how they themselves shape and modify their space. And there are three big factors to consider. Here. First, a society's attitude toward ethnicity affects how they occupy a space. Now, ethnicity, when being defined, is a quality of a people that binds them together, including a shared language and cultural heritage. So a good example here would be the various Chinatowns in New York City, which contain a high concentration of, you know, Chinese Americans and Chinese immigrants. So the question we need to answer is this. What does it tell us about New York's historical attitude toward ethnicity that their Chinese populations are so concentrated in these places, but not in these places? Well, it should tell you that there have been periods of U.S. history when Americans weren't that fond of Chinese immigrants, and due to that cultural pressure, Chinese people living in New York clustered together in ethnic neighborhoods so that they could preserve their own culture and traditions, which the dominant culture rejected. So it was attitudes about ethnicity, at least in part, that led to this spatial arrangement of the city. Okay, now the second factor that determines how a people will occupy a space includes their attitudes about gender. So in more traditional societies in which strict gender roles exist, the cultural landscape will be modified accordingly. For example, India has some parks that are segregated by gender, men only and women only. Now some women see these spaces as a safe place to be among women apart from men, while others see it as discriminatory to have isolated gendered spaces. But then cultural landscapes are also affected by women's presence or absence in the workplace. In Western culture, for example, the workplace, until relatively recently, has been the domain of men folk. And the home has been the domain of the women folk, where they were expected to do everybody's nasty laundry and raise all the children. But in the last 50 years, women have been entering the workforce at a rapid pace, and that has led to a new spatial phenomenon in the built environment, namely childcare centers and office buildings. And that tells us a lot. Like, there were never childcare centers and office buildings when men were running everybody's crap. But now that women are working more, there they are. And that further indicates that while women have gained ground in terms of gender equity, they are still seen as the primary caretakers of children. And finally, the presence of indigenous communities and land also affects how a society occupies space. Here in the U.S., you can see that we have many reservations on which indigenous or Native Americans live. And in case you know precisely nothing about U.S. history, this was not the spatial pattern these people inhabited 500 years ago. But this distribution reflects a cultural landscape that includes a history of discrimination and forced removal of indigenous peoples into concentrated areas so that they would be, you know, out of the way of dominant culture. Okay, click here to keep reviewing Unit 3 and click here to grab my video note guides, which are really great for students who hate reading their textbooks but still want to do well in the class. And I'll catch you on the flip-flop. I'm Lerout.